Good morning. Welcome to our services. Will you take your uh, folders and stand with me? And we're going to turn to Song 22 in your Burgundy folders. We're going to sing all three verses of His Mercy is More, Song 22. could remember no wrongs we have done amiss and all knowing he counts not their son from him to us he without water more sure our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is It is good to have you here on what really is a beautiful Sunday for the 1st of February. Uh, we're going to pray, and then we'll be seated, and then Brother Dan Alati and Glenn Koiker will continue on in prayer for a bit. So let's go together to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for your kind grace. We thank you for the beautiful day that we are enjoying, and we thank you for the beauties of your holiness. And we pray, Father, that we would know you as well as we are able to, given our humanity. And we pray that the greatness of your name would be known around the world. We pray for those who lead us politically, that they would know and fear you and make decisions in righteousness. We pray that they would understand what a terrible future awaits them if they reject you. We ask your blessing upon our services this morning and the services of all of your churches around the world, that our singing would be from our hearts about you and your glory, that we would hear your word and respond appropriately. We ask for your power to that end then. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we truly thank you again today for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, as we look around and as we see things unfolding before our eyes, Father, and we sometimes wonder, is there really hope for all of us? And our hope rests in you, Father, because we know you are the one who controls all things. And we just ask now, Father, as we come together as a body of your people, that you would bless us, bless us beyond what we deserve, and just keep us in your care, Father. And we just pray now that you be with those assemblies that are meeting today and that your word might be spread throughout the world. Father, we ask also that you be with our leaders, those who are in decision-making positions that all that they do and all that they say might be in countenance with you, Father. And we just pray now that your blessings might continue to watch over us and be on us as we go through our day 
And as we continue in this service of worship, may your blessings be upon the pastor as he brings the word to your people. For this we ask in your blessed and most holy name. Amen. Father, we do praise you and thank you, Lord. You are our hope, our confidence, Lord. We, uh, we trust in you. We have no other, we have nothing else to, to hope for but in your mercy and your grace, which uh, has been shed abroad. And Lord, we do pray for our uh, people around the world, people in our own neighborhoods, our own family, Lord, that they might come to know you, that they might be born again to be part of the family of God. And Lord, we do pray for leaders. We, uh, we are afraid that uh, godless men and women lead us, but Lord, uh, you are sovereign, you are ruler of all, and you can use folks like this to to make conditions uh, favorable that we might live in peace and we might uh, continue to proclaim the word of the Lord. And Lord, we commit ourselves to you this day. Help us to be pure and holy. Help us to uh, live in the light of, of your eternal greatness, I pray in Jesus' name. you'll take your uh, burgundy folders again we're going to turn to psalm uh, song 31 this is a new song that we sang for the first time a couple weeks ago so we're going to sing it again so we can get a little more familiar with it we'll sing all four verses of song 31 whatever my god ordains is right take your hymnals now. We're going to turn to hymn 531. Today's sermon is on the Christian's wardrobe, dressing for the Christian life. Uh, this song references how God gives us peace that lasts. Uh, 
we'll sing all four verses of Wonderful Peace, hymn, hymn 531.
you'll stand with me again and take your hymnals. We're going to turn to hymn 273 and sing all three verses of it. It's just like his great love. This song talks about Jesus keeps us with his love. Hymn 273. <laughs>
Thank you, sir. Amen. Colossians chapter 3 this morning. Colossians chapter number 3. We have been giving some time. Oh, yes, Children's Church. We had uh, been giving some time to the subject matter of forgiveness. And last week I mentioned was my really my final summary message on that subject, not that we would ever exhaust it, but we will turn our attention away from it. However, this morning I do wish to bring somewhat of an epilogue that includes the idea but is a little bit more inclusive than simply the subject matter of forgiveness. And then, Lord willing, next week we will begin to move on to other things. Let's go ahead and stand, please. And we're going to begin really in the middle of something Paul is saying, verse number 12, and read down to verse number 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And let's pray. Father, thank you for saving us Thank you for making us new creatures. Thank you for living inside of us. Thank you that your internal presence, not simply your external existence, is the earnest of our salvation, the assurance that we will be fully, completely, totally, irrevocably saved, brought into your glorious presence, there to live with you forever. And now, Father, as always, it is your desire that we live that reality. And I pray then for the enabling power of your spirit, both in the preaching and in the obedience to your instruction this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may, of course, be seated. Well, how we dress when we come to church is something that is important to everybody. And I personally believe that it is just as important, if not as not as important, to all, not simply those on the conservative side of the spectrum. And I mentioned that because in verse number 12, Paul uses wording that describes the physical act of getting dressed to talk to us about the way we are to conduct ourselves as Christians. And in fact, the first word, put on, put on. In Matthew 6.25, we find that word used this way, take no thought what ye shall put on. Don't worry about what you'll wear. God will clothe you. In Mark 1, 6, we read that John the Baptist was clothed. Same word. And in Mark 15, 17, part of the ridicule of Jesus Christ was that they clothed him with purple. All of these kinds of uses throughout the Bible, The Gospels, the Acts, the Revelation, we find Jesus and men and angels clothed. They have put on 
garments. But in the epistles, whether they be written by Paul or John or Peter, all of the uses of this kind of language are metaphorical in nature or symbolic in nature. We know that clothing has several messages as developed in the scriptures. For instance, in Luke 16, we read of the man who was rich, and we know that he is rich because he was clothed in purple and fine linen. And I wonder if one of the reasons that God, when he actually does in the epistles, talk about what we wear, he takes such a dim view of getting overly dressed up. It is because of the fact that people are so inclined to associate status with clothing. And in the church, we are all equal before the Lord. And there's no place for any of us to try and set ourselves apart by the elegance of what we wear. Sometimes our clothing is used to represent our emotional state. We find numerous passages, particularly in the Old Testament, of people who put on sackcloth and smeared themselves with ashes as a sign of mourning. So our clothing can represent our emotions and it can represent our wealth. It can represent our spiritual condition as it did with Adam and Eve and as it did with the man who was found trying to attend a wedding feast without a wedding garment. And we're reading the book of Revelation about the saints dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And sometimes clothing is used to describe preparedness, to be ready for an activity. We are commanded at times to gird up our loins, which in the Bible world referred to taking your long, for men, to take your long floor-length robe and tuck it up into your belt so that you could get to business. Gird up your loins. So whether it is, and I think that probably in Colossians we could bring the latter two to bear, it is not just our spiritual condition, not just position, like white linen represents the position of the saints, but also symbolically a preparedness to live a certain way. And I would argue that First of all, on the basis of verse number 12, when Paul begins to talk about our standing, our position, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, dress according to your position. Dress according to your standing. In verses 8 through 11, which we did not read, and I'm not going to spend much time on, Paul is talking about just the opposite. Here are things you need to take off. You need to divest yourselves of some kinds of clothing. The old man has been put off, and with the old man goes the old clothes. But we are now the new man. And so in verse 12, put on therefore as God's elect. As people who belong to him, as people who have been called by him, old animosities are gone. No longer do we think of ourselves as Greeks or Jews or as Americans and Peruvians. I think of that because today we were supposed to get on an airplane this afternoon and fly to where it's 80 degrees.
We are not to think of ourselves along the lines of circumcised and uncircumcised. We are not to think of ourselves along the lines of being crude and refined. And I'm just actually referencing things that you would find in verses 8 through 11. I'm not making up my own list. We are not to think of ourselves as being in bondage or as free men. But we are in Christ. We are in Christ, put on therefore as the elect of God. And if we would think about those things, were we to go back and work our way carefully through verses 8 through 11, we would realize, folks, that this is not superficial, incidental material. Think about the way that ethnicity divides people. All over the world, not just in America, not just black and white, we are divided ethnically by tribes, by cultures, by countries, by borders. And we think about the way religion divides, and there's a sense in which it is good to have religious divides, unless we're all in the same religion. And think about the way things like social status and education divide, even in our country, folks, even in our country. We tend to be divisive about how much education, what your status is. But as saved people, verse number 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, there is a whole different set of clothing for born-again people to wear. And all of this is governed by the fact that we belong to God. We are his chosen people, his holy people, his beloved people. Verse 12. Put on as the elect of God, his chosen, holy, beloved. He loves his chosen people. So he talks first about our standing. There is something that unites the people of God. That transcends our racial identity. That transcends our ethnicity. That transcends our education and our status. And that is Christ. And then in verses 12 through 16, he talks about our clothing. Put on a certain type of clothing. Put on as you would to get dressed. And he actually lists there eight separate pieces, if you want to think of it that way. Eight separate pieces of clothing in the Christian closet. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, forgiveness, charity. Now, unlike our wardrobes, we're supposed to wear all eight pieces all the time. But they are eight distinct pieces of clothing. And I would propose to you that we could arrange those eight different pieces of clothing into separate categories the way that we would separate our closets into categories. Winter wear, summer wear, perhaps lounge wear, perhaps formal wear, perhaps outer wear. Here are the categories that I would propose to you that the eight pieces of Christian clothing could fall under. One set of clothing covers how we think about ourselves. As somebody who belongs to God, as somebody who has been saved by the blood of Christ, as somebody who has been delivered from the old nature and the old animosities, the first article of clothing to put on is a way to think about yourself. Humility of mind. Humility of mind. Humility is in its true biblical form, a proper estimation of ourselves. 
It is not a false modesty. A true estimation of ourselves is that we are sinners who have been saved by God's grace and yet have been gifted by him to serve him by serving the body in a unique way. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said that this was true of him. That he was meek and lowly in heart. So that when I put on this article of Christian clothing, this way of thinking about myself, it is the way that Christ thought about himself. He did not mean, I'm not God. He did not mean, I cannot speak. He did not mean, I cannot do miracles. I am meek and lowly in heart. A proper view of who he was at that moment of time. So there is a category of clothing. The way that we think about ourselves. Another set of clothing, and this one has more pieces in the wardrobe, is the way that we treat other people. But I think that we would all understand, if we think about it, that the way we treat other people is in large part inextricably tied to the way we think about ourselves. I will never treat you biblically if I ultimately think about myself as a superior. I will never be able to do it. If I think too much of me, I will never be able to think properly about you. Verse number 12. Bowels of mercies. And you'll notice, folks, that I am rearranging them from Paul's order with some trepidation. Bowels of mercies. Compassion. It reads as an odd word to us, but it was not odd to Paul. And in fact, it really is not odd to modern science. It is a word that describes the inner turmoil of our stomach at the sufferings of another. You ever watch somebody take a serious fall? Hit the concrete hard and you just kind of cringe? Bowels of mercies. This is another attribute that we find in Christ our Savior. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercies. Jesus was oftentimes moved with compassion. He internally churned at the grief that others experienced, at the sadness, at the way sin had ravaged them. He was moved. Put it on, says the Lord. Put it on. Put this on as well, kindness. Kindness. The absence of ill will and malice. Three times in the book of Romans, Paul uses the Greek word that is used here. It is always translated good. Romans 2.4, Romans 3.12, Romans 11.22. Kindness. Jesus showed it to us when he saved us, Titus 3.4. But after that, the kindness. There's the word. The kindness of love and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared. Put it on. Right? We, are, we are, folks, empowered and expected as believers to consciously disrobe ourselves of ill will and malice and envy and strife and pride and arrogance. And we are to clothe ourselves with the right frame of mind about who we are and what God has done for us and to treat others in a certain way with compassion and with kindness and with meekness. Jesus said again, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, I am meek here and lowly of heart, humble. 
Meekness implies a gentleness in the way we deal with other people. And then there is this one, long-suffering. Long-suffering. Patient. And there are just so many places we were told about how long-suffering God is. From human perspective, people tend to think that God is unmoved and indifferent and uncaring as to what is happening, whether it be our own personal suffering or somebody's sin. But long-suffering actually defies that. God is tolerating. God is tolerating, not ignoring. There's a difference. There's a difference. So one article of clothing we put on, folks, that governs the way we think about everybody else or the way we think about ourselves, which impacts everybody else. And there's another part of our wardrobe, like summer wear and winter wear, that governs the way we treat other people. And then there is another set of clothing that we wear that covers the way we receive treatment from other people. How I think about myself. How I treat you. And what I wear to cover how you treat me. Verse number 13, forbearing one another. The idea there really has, or the word really has the idea of kind of holding yourself together. Or bearing. And forgiving. And being gracious and dismissive. When there is a quarrel, if any man have a quarrel, So if somebody has a quarrel with you, what's the, right, what's the right way to respond? Well, it just so happens, folks, that God has an outfit for that. God has a set of clothing that demonstrates our preparedness to be treated in a certain way. And then there is a final piece of clothing that holds all of it together. Verse number 14, above all these things, you'll notice in your King James Bible that the verb put on is supplied. It's not stated, but our translators, I think, rightly understood that Paul was continuing on with the getting dressed metaphor. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. What holds it all together, the way that I think about myself and the way that I treat you and the way that I respond when you treat me is all tied together by love. It is the binding agent is the idea. It is the binding. You have all these, you have all these little pieces, folks, and love is the glue that holds it all together. They don't just float around out there disconnected. Love is the glue that holds it all together. If we do not think properly about ourselves and if we do not love, first of all, our Lord, secondly, those of his people, we will never get the rest of the outfit right. But God doesn't just tell us what to wear. He's telling us what to wear. Eight distinct items of clothing. Christian clothing that are to be put on. Referring to the way we think about ourselves, the way we treat other people, and the way we respond when we are treated. God gives us rules. Just like there are rules about, you've got to be my age to remember this rule, right? But you don't wear white after Labor Day. And I had this conversation with one of our members not terribly long ago. They said to me, 
what is it with navy blue suits and brown shoes? And I said, you know, it's really interesting because when I was a child, and once upon a time I was a child, my mother taught me that you never wore brown with blue. You wore black with blue. And we always wore black with blue. And it wasn't terribly long after I had that conversation with one of our members that I was looking at a picture of a pastor on Facebook and his four sons. They were all wearing navy blue suits. Dad, who is older than I am, was wearing black shoes, and all of his boys were wearing brown shoes. The rules have changed. You may now wear brown with blue. But there are rules. But they're just, right? And in a dress, I mean, they tend to be informal rules, right? And there's no law that says you can't wear white after Labor Day. God's rules are rules. They come to us in the form of imperatives. Here's how to dress. You belong to God. You're one of his people. You're a holy person. He loves you. You have to dress this way. You have to get the proper garment on about the way you think about yourself. You have to get the right garments on about the way you treat other people. You have to be wearing the right outfit to receive treatment at the hands of other people. Verse 15 and 16, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you're also called in one body. Be thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So here are the rules that help us as we're wearing the clothing. Rule number one, let God's peace rule. And the actual idea of the word there is referee. Let peace be the referee. All right, I can cause trouble or I cannot cause trouble. Let peace be the referee. Don't look for trouble. Don't cause trouble. Don't advance trouble. Let God's peace be the referee. Be thankful. Another imperative, verse 15. Be thankful. This is tied back to a proper way of thinking about ourselves. Here's a third rule. Let God's word live in you. Let the word of God dwell. Let the word of God dwell. And here's what I think Paul is getting at when he uses that kind of language. When you live somewhere, that tends to be space that you control. My wife and I are doing some remodeling in our kitchen. We're doing the remodeling in our kitchen because we live there. It's space we control. We're not remodeling your kitchen. We're remodeling our kitchen. It's our space. Let God's word control your space. Let God's word control your space. And if you'll notice, folks, and I'm not looking for a fight, but I have not read verse number 16 following the grammar of our King James Bible. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I would put the comma there. In all wisdom. Wisdom that is found in the scriptures. Here are things to do. teaching and admonishing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Teach and admonish and sing. 
Let the word rule your space. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. So Paul begins by talking to us about our standing in verse number 12. And then Paul talks to us about our clothing in verses 12 through 16. And then Paul talks to us about everything in verse 17. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Whatever you do. So here we, here we are. I mean, we could, somebody who was really good in art could draw a picture of this. A Christian who has taken off old hostilities, old hatreds, old animosities, and laid them aside. No longer appropriate clothing for somebody who belongs to the Lord and has been called in holiness and who is loved by God. And put on now these things, humility of mind. Put on attributes that are going to govern the way you treat other people. Put on clothing that is going to be prepare you to respond to the way you are treated. Because not everybody is going to get verses 12 through 14. At least at the same time. And then remember their rules. Remember that you called to love. And remember that God has called us to peace. And as much as is humanly possible, we're always in the pursuit of peace. And the word of God always rules our space. All space. Our minds, our emotions, our ambitions, our words, our activities. The word of God dwells. So that verse 17, whatever we do, whether it's something we say in word or something we do in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, which, folks, we understand, I hope, means to be able to do it in such a way that God would approve of it being done. That's really what we're supposed to mean when we say things like, in Jesus' name, amen. That I am asking you to do something that I think you could put your name to. That you would approve. In harmony with his name, in harmony with his words, in harmony with his wishes, in harmony with the way that Jesus lived. And we express in that gratitude to God, giving thanks to God. And I would tie that back, folks, to verse number 12, to the God who loves us. We are beloved. And we all know, folks, that what tends to happen is, right, when when we are spoken to in a way we don't approve or we are treated in a way that is not right, we very quickly lose sight of the fact that God loves us. that the providence of God extends even to those things. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord. This is the exact sentiment that Paul expressed in Romans 14 that governs us, that we do what we do to the Lord. So give thanks to the Father, to God the Father, by him. All through Jesus, always, because he is our mediator. I think that verse 17, folks, just kind of carries with it the idea that giving thanks to God and doing things in his name are woven together. Two separate things that fit together in perfect harmony. So here is 
God's instruction to us as a New Testament church on what to wear. Put off that which pertained to the old man. Put on as God's people a way of thinking about yourself. A way of treating others. A way of responding to the way you are treated. Follow the rules that God has given because he is the God that loves you and is always at work in the lives of his people. Let's pray. Father, I pray again both for the proclamation of the word and the implementation of the word in our lives that we would be submissive to your instruction. That we would fully enjoy our status as your beloved, holy, chosen people. That we would wear humility Wear kind treatment of others governed by peace, forbearing the offenses of others. Thankful always to you for your righteousness and justice. I pray this for us in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me make a few announcements to you this morning, and we will be dismissed. So good to have you here. Just a reminder that tonight is our regularly scheduled potluck fellowship and teen afterglow you are invited to stay of course it is a potluck fellowship but let me remind you further we need no desserts tonight dessert has been cared for and uh, so uh, just um, now again again I made the exclusion Wednesday night right if Mrs. Hughes wants to bring some of her drug laced oatmeal cookies that's a whole nother subject but for the most part you need not bring dessert. And then just a reminder, our package for Brother Jeff McCurdy is going to go out this week. And so um, thank you for your contributions to that. If you have anything else yet to give, please get it to us today or by first thing in the morning. And we'll be getting that uh, sent off to him. And then just a reminder, gentlemen, men's Bible study is Tuesday night here at 6, 630. I think 630 is Bible study. I didn't... Um, and then let me just mention this to you. The table's been out for a couple of weeks, but back as you go right into the multipurpose building, there's a table set up filled as so often happens with lost and found items. Um, if you'd go back there and see if anything belongs to you or your children, I uh, would appreciate that. And then, of course, 6 o'clock evening service, 5 o'clock choir practice. Let's stand and we'll have our closing song. Nelson turn to him 113. We're going to sing together the third verse of Here is Love, hymn 113. I sing the first verse, we're going to sing the third verse now. If you sing the third verse, I'm sorry, you have to sing it twice. At the beginning with the third verse. Of your fullness you are pouring your great love on me anew. Without measure, full and boundless, draw me now, my heart to you.
Have a wonderful afternoon.